There's a few different ways to test a capacitor and different parameters to test for. Uh, commonly one will go through a circuit with a DVM or a VOM, look for any shorted capacitors. Um, beyond that you're kind of stuck. you got to pretty much pull them out of circuit to really use a ohmmeter um, to check for leakage. Um, and in a slightly bigger middle size capacitor to bigger capacitors you can see them charge on a DVM or voltmeter as well. Um, of course a big cap you'll never charge off of a DVM. It's just going to take way too long unless you've got lots of patience. Um, so you can check. There's also meters that will check capacity. So you've got leakage, you've got capacity. And um, a capacity type tester generally also will need the capacitor to be taken out of circuit. And um, there's no replacement for that really. That if you really want to know the capacity, you need such a device. If you're and a lot, nowadays a lot of DVMs got it built in. This one doesn't. Some of the better ones do. I don't know if you put that in quotes or not. There's arguments. You know, if you listen to about features on you know meters and what's too much and what's useful. For you. I think a capacitance reading would be uh, handy to have on a DVM myself. There's another way to test capacitors. And that is to look at the equivalent series resistance, the ESR of the capacitor. And this isn't so valuable for uh, regular capacitors, you know, small value uh, film or um, mica or whatever else you might have, ceramic capacitors. It's not really uh, too often used on those. But electrolytic capacitors, especially in circuit, are kind of tough to test sometimes with the other equipment. So by using equivalent series resistance a lot of times you can ferret out bad electrolytic capacitors and you can ferret them out in circuit too most of the time because this relates to equivalent series resistance meaning if you had a ideal capacitor well you don't have an ideal capacitor so a real capacitor has got somewhat of a series capac uh, resistance into it. Um, as if there was a resistor in series at the leads. There's also a series inductance people don't talk about too much. And uh, that is also a factor in electro electrolytic capacitors. That's why you've got audio electrolytic capacitors where the winding, uh, the wrapping of it switches halfway or something like that to prevent inductance. If you wrap it all up in one big coil, and depending on how you attach your leads, you can get a little bit of inductance out of electrolytic, which is obviously something you don't want in an audio circuit. So, this equivalent series resistance is going to be very small, and I'm trying to figure out how, this, how a device would work to test that. I already erased part of my board. So, if this was a uh, signal source, little oscillator. I had a sine wave in here. Got erased. Um, and anyway, you got your high frequency signal here. And you've got a reference resistor. And then some kind of voltmeter. It's actually scaled to a different scale. It's not scaled to volts. It's scaled to this ESR reading that you're going to get. But it's basically what I imagine is in this type of unit. Now I bought this unit from uh, Banggood, I believe. Yeah, I'm pretty 99% sure. Uh, and I gave it a bad review. Unfortunately, Banggood doesn't let you edit your reviews. It doesn't even let you comment on your own reviews. So I gave it a bad review because I could not get it to do anything. Um, I couldn't get any kind of useful results off of it. Finally... That's not going to work. i got to find a little lift, lift capacitor here to play with. Uh, finally, I, I read a comment on Banggood that explained how to use it. Because I, I wrote them, said it didn't work, tried every possible way I could think of to use it. I couldn't get any results out of it. I gave it a bad review. Someone else wrote in, well, this is how you use it. You take the two wires, 
and short them out before you turn it on. Then you turn it on and then you attach a capacitor. What do we have here? We've got a 2UF 50 volt capacitor. Okay. So I'm going to hook it up. And if you do it th this way, you start with a short, turn the meter on, and then hook it up, you actually do get a reading. I'm getting 30N. 30 nano ohms, I think it is. So I look up 20 on the chart here. And uh, now I changed my light around. Anyway, I look up about 20 UF resistor. Here's 22. Um, now I look at the appropriate voltage column. And I'm high here. Well, no, it's 2. You get 3 if it was a 10 volt, 2 if it was 16 volts. Two if it was a 25 volt, so two is about right. And I got 31, so this is a bad cap. And this cap's been sitting around for a long time. This is one I actually picked up off the ground 20 years ago. <laughs> got a whole bunch of these little blue ones like this. Let's try a. And you know, that's a non polarized capacitor too, so I'm not sure this is going to actually be exactly right. Is this non polarized? It's got too dense. That one isn't. This one is another of the same. Let's go reading on these again. These were, yeah, 2UF 50 volts. So, uh, closest thing I got here is 2.2. .2, and closest thing I got is 63. So it's an 8. should be at most an 8. Alright, let's test another one of the same. So we do the same procedure again. Shut it off. Short the leads, turn it on, connect the component, and this one's better. This one's 11N, which is still out of spec, but it's nowhere near as out of spec as this one. So what happens to electrolytics um, without going too deep to theory of electrolytics? Well, I'll go through it real quick. You've got two plates in the capacitor. You got two plates separated by an insulator. Nothing ever flows from one plate to the other in an ideal capacitor. In an electrolytic capacitor, you've got two aluminum plates, and you've got a conductive electrolyte between them. So initially, when a capacitor is made, it's a conductor. There's nothing to really stop it from going from one plate to another. So in the factory, they form it. And forming is just a matter of running a current through the capacitor um, until oxide builds up on one layer. And aluminum oxide is one of the toughest oxides there is. It's used in sandpaper. It's a very, very tough, very good insulator. So you build up an aluminum oxide until no current flows because it builds up as the current flows across the plates. And it builds up on the one plate real heavy until the current's down to almost nothing. At that point, the capacitor is considered formed, and that's what we use for electrolytic capacitors. And they do that because that oxide layer is very thin, and the little plates are tight together. So that oxide layer separating them is a nice, thin, intimate connection. That's non-conductive, so it's you know yields a good capacitance. Um, so what happens to electrolytic capacitors is, is in working you know, heating up and cooling down with the circuit board and everything else, ultimately the seals will give. And this is the difference in capacitors between a really crummy capacitor and a uh, really long-lived good capacitor. Electrolytic capacitors are always going to be a failure unit, and they are always going to have, you know, be one of the most failure-prone components that we have. But... There's certainly a heck of a difference between some of these cheap Chinese capacitors and uh, the really good Japanese capacitors like the, everybody knows the Rubicon and everything else. And the electrolytic capacitors that used to be made in the U.S., the uh, Cornell Dubliners and stuff like that. Um, and I brought up the case of that, and I've got a video on this if you look back in my collection, 
a solderless repair of the uh, receiver. Um, what was the brand of that? Stereo Master. What was the brand? Anyway, I worked on an old receiver of my parents, which is probably like 45 years old almost. It's like, it's so old it's got transistor sockets in it. And none of those electric electrolytics in that unit has failed to the point where the unit doesn't work. And I'm sure if I went through there and tested them all, I'd find, you know, some marginal ones. But they're uh, Nashville capacitors made in USA. And they've been in there for over 40 years, and that unit still works. Uh, whereas a lot of these Chinese caps are failing, you know, in a year or two. And it has to do with the chemistry of the electrolyte being properly prepared. And there's a whole story about that, too. Uh, supposedly a bad formula was leaked to the Chinese. Um, that's a long story, and I don't have anything to back it up. The uh, other thing is the seals, you know. How good are the seals? If the seals don't hold, the electrolyte dries up, the equivalent series resistance starts to climb. So that's why this is an effective way to test. And it's effective because it uses a low resistance inside the capacitor. So it's pretty good at being able to test in circuit because that low resistance of the ESR is something you can check for um, without a lot of competing parts normally. You don't normally have to pull them out of circuit to test, test them with this kind of tester. Because so it's looking for that low, low resistance to its high frequency signal. So, that's about it. Um, the thing about this meter is I really wanted to get one of these, but they were like 220 bucks or somewhere in that neighborhood. And I never seen any price breaks and I tried shopping for them. Um, somebody I used to watch a lot, uh, he hasn't made too many videos in quite a while, Max Arcade, uh, really demonstrated how to use one of these meters. He's got the good, the good real one. I saw this one for like 30 bucks or less. Not even 30 bucks, I don't think it was. I'll, I'll pull the ad up and add to this video. I go, wow, what a deal. And then, of course, it didn't work, and you got the story from there. Now it does work, now that I know how to use it. So, all in all, versus buying one for 200 bucks, <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. And here it is on Banggood. The instructions here are pretty piss poor, they don't really help. Roughly nine, let's call it. Nine times 20 milliseconds. And um, height wise, it's not very strong either. It's uh, So it's a very high frequency. And uh, height wise, I am on what, the 20 millivolts? Yeah, 20 millivolts per division. So, what, 60 millivolts? And that frequency and amplitude do change. Here's a bigger capacitor. You can see the amplitude sucked way down. Um, I changed the frequency to, uh, what are we on here, 50. So the frequency slowed down a little bit. I've got nine and a half divisions at 50 milliseconds. Microsecond, excuse me.